Okay, so we'll discuss some aspects of, um, of dielectric response um, as we compute it by means of perturbation theory, linear response, or uh, the use of finite electric fields. Um, so dielectric response, um, and then we'll speak about frequency dependent dielectric properties and static dielectric response and response from ele to electric fields from density for, uh, functional perturbation theory um, and, 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 and a few other um, aspects. Um, so why would we want to uh, compute this? Well, in itself, obviously, uh, the frequency and static dependent, uh, um, static and frequency dependent dielectric functions uh, correspond to, uh, to certain things that we measure, right? So absorption, reflectance, and things like this. And in the long wavelength limit of the frequency dependent uh, polarizability and dielectric matrices, we have uh, uh, things that determine the optical properties um, in the regimes that are accessible to uh, optical and electronic probes. Uh, so there's a, there's a reason in itself uh, to, to compute these uh, properties uh, for their connection to experiment. Um, but they're also needed in, uh, in uh, several levels of theory that go beyond, uh, well, beyond DFT and hybrid functional theory, uh, of which most prominently uh, uh, I'd like to mention uh, GW, of which we'll hear a bit more uh, today. And so, so like, like I already uh, alluded to is that, that GW is sort of an, uh, a screened uh, exchange interaction. And the screening that we apply there is not, not like in hybrid functional theory, a simple uh, quarter or something, but it's going to be material dependent and it's based on, uh, uh, on the computation of the, of the frequency dependent microscopic dielectric response, right? So we need these quantities uh, to enter them into, into these higher level methods. Um, yeah, and then there's, there's a few other things um, that are well, I won't go into that uh, too much. Um, one thing I would like to mention is that, for instance, uh, and that's another one of these methods, so um, GW is one. The other one that, that I would like to mention is the, the beta cell Peter equation, uh, so where we, uh, where we try to include uh, excitonic effects um, uh, in, in, in predictions of optical properties of, uh, of materials, and there the dielectric screening of the potential is also needed to uh, include these effects. And so GW and, and, and the beta cell Peter equation, there are some, uh, some examples on, on these uh, calculations <coughs> in the hands-on uh, sessions. So what kind of uh, quantities do we calculate? Well, frequency dependent uh, quantities, we calculate um, the microscopic dielectric matrix, uh, either in the random phase approximation uh, or beyond, um, including, change, <laughs> including changes in the, in the DFT exchange uh, correlation potential. I'll show you later on what that means. Um, and in the, for the frequency dependent macroscopic dielectric tensor, uh, we compute imaginary real parts of the dielectric function uh, in or excluding local field effects, uh, either in the RPA or including changes in DFT exchange correlation potential as well. So and static properties include things like static dielectric tensor, Born effective charges. So Born effective charges are, are the things so that are um, often called dynamical charges as well. So if I move an atom, how much of, of charge moves with my atom? That is Born effective charge. Um, and that we do in or excluding local field effects. And what local field effects are, I'll, I'll mention as well. And uh, this is either done from density functional perturbation theory um, or from the self-consistent response to a finite electric field, right? And so there's, there's reasons why well, we have these two methods that <coughs> essentially yield the same information. Um, problem is the density functional perturbation theory only works for density functionals, so not for hybrid functionals. And uh, this speed method that uh, allows us to compute the self-consistent response to a finite electric field, that works for, um, for hybrid functionals as well, but only uh, for isolating systems, so not for metallic systems. 
So there are some limits to, to these different methods. So if we look at, at, uh, at uh, dielectric properties, what are we talking about? So in a, in a macroscopic sense, uh, we're talking about this dielectric tensor here, uh, for instance, that, that, um, that connects an ex externally applied field to uh, the field uh, in a material. Yeah, that's our dielectric tensor. And in a longitudinal field, uh, which is a field caused by uh, stationary charges, uh, you can formulate this as uh, well an externally applied potential connected to a total potential in a system, uh, where our total potential is this externally applied potential and the induced <coughs> potential. And so this is the dielectric tensor. So some terminology around this. Uh, Induced potential is generated by an induced charge density. Well, that makes sense in a sort of, in a way, right? And in the linear response regime, uh, which means for suffi sufficiently weak fields, uh, we have a, a relationship by the, uh, between the externally applied potential and the induced charge density. And that is through the reducible polarizability. Um, and, uh, uh, and a relationship between the total potential, uh, sorry, yeah, the total potential and the induced charge uh, through the irreducible polarizability. And then there's a bunch of uh, relationships between them. Uh, it's not so important. I don't need to memorize these, but we're obviously, but we're going to be using them uh, a, a lot. So the inverse dielectric tensor is related through uh, through this relationship to the uh, reducible polarizability. And this, this new here, uh, this is essentially the Coulomb interaction, right? So this polarizability times the Coulomb interaction plus one gives us the, um, the inverse dielectric tensor. There's a relationship between the irreducible polarizability and the dielectric tensor. And between these bo both these polarizabilities, there's a relationship of this form, uh, which is a Dyson equation or a Dyson-like equation. Right. <coughs> so we're going to be toying with, with these uh, quite a bit. Um, so, well, those, not, not that, yeah, it's a description, or macroscopic description. Like we said, well, we need a connection to microscopic quantities because we don't, in codes like, li like ours, we don't deal with macroscopic quantities, right? Deal with microscopic quantities. And essentially, uh, well, there's, um, so there, a whole bunch of indices uh, come into play. So we have a field and a dependency on, on the position, so externally applied field and a frequency. And then we have a tensor of this kind uh, that depends on the distance between uh, two points. Right, so we write it as a, um, yes. And if we write it like this, so for sufficiently, uh, and this is the, macroscop <coughs> the macroscopic tensor, depends only on the distance. Uh, if we have, uh, if we have uh, only a, di uh, sorry, a difference here and not two coordinates, we can Fourier transform this uh, into momentum space uh, using only one coordinate and end up with a relationship <coughs> like this for macroscopic uh, quantities. And a microscopic dielectric function then enters in uh, such a way, right? And in momentum space, that means, uh, so in a macroscopic way, it's only the distance between so in a macroscopic uh, description, it's only the distance between two points that is, of, uh, that is of importance. If you then go to a microscopic description of your system, it's the actual points where I am in my system that are, that are of consequence. Uh, uh, so in a microscopic electric field uh, that, that is induced by an externally applied field, uh, we have a more complicated um, a dielectric function where we don't only have the distance between R and R prime, but it depends actually where I am with respect to my atomic nucleus or something like this, uh, these microscopic aspects. And if we Fourier transform this, uh, we have um, no longer only one Fourier <coughs> component, but two positions, so we end up with a function that depends on G and G prime. So that already gives you some inkling of, of, of of what is going to be costly, for instance, uh, because this is going to be costly to store, for instance, because it doesn't depend only on one coordinate or on one Fourier component, but already on two. So, and both of them obviously are, are linked in the usual manner by, by some uh, 
uh, some matter of averaging, right? So I'm averaging over a certain volume. Um, all that, that's not something that we're going to be using, but yes, that is the link between microscopic and macroscopic worlds. So assuming that, that our, our external fields vary on a length scale that's much larger than the atomic distances, um, we have a, a, a more um, a simpler connection between um, the externally applied field and the resulting field, and that's given by the head of this uh, inverse dielectric matrix. And then we have a very, uh, very um, simple connection between a macroscopic dielectric constant uh, and some aspect, some quantity that we, uh, that we in fact can calculate, a microscopic quantity. So, and that, uh, so for materials that are homogeneous on, uh, on a microscopic scale, um, the off-diagonal off -diagonal parts of this matrix are of no consequence, huh? and they're, they're a zero, sorry. So for G is not G prime, they're a zero, and then it reduces even to this uh, particular relationship. So <coughs> being able to compute these microscopic uh, quantities uh, under the assumptions that we have an external field that varies on a length scale that's much larger than atomic distances, and materials that are homogeneous on a microscopic scale, under these assumptions, we have a direct access to a quantity, uh, to, to a quantity in the macroscopic world. And this is what we call, for instance, um, so the fact that we assume that the material is homogeneous on a microscopic scale, uh, that is what we call a neglect of local field effects. I'm just sort of throwing this in because you will see this in, in, uh, in literature. It's not, um, I just want to give you a feeling for what, what these terms, if you encounter them in literature, what these terms mean. Okay, so, um, these functions that we saw before, these, <coughs> these, um, these microscopic dielectric functions, I've written them out here more explicitly um, in terms of, uh, of well, functions uh, and quantities in reciprocal space. Uh, so here we see this, uh, which was called the reducible polarizability, which is the change in the density, uh, so the induced density uh, when we change uh, the external potential. So a change in the re induced density as a response to a change in the external potential, well, at a certain, uh, at a certain uh, Fourier component, at a certain frequency of our field. Um, uh, so this is spatial variation of the density. This would be uh, with respect to time, uh, but then transferred into the frequency domain. Same thing for the external potential um, that we use. This is what I said, uh, this, this uh, Coulomb kernel. So this, this represents the Coulomb interaction in reciprocal <coughs> space. It does look a bit different than what we saw before because it has been symmetrized. So it's symmetric with respect to G and G prime. You are allowed to do this because the, the spectrum of such an operator is exactly the same. So you're always allowed to either use the Coulomb operator, which would be one over G squared, for instance, or one over Q plus G. Uh, squared, or its symmetric uh, counterpart, which is Q plus G times Q plus G prime. Okay, so and this is uh, the inverse dielectric function. Uh, same thing for the dielectric function, um, as, it as it depends on the um, um, irreducible uh, polarizability, right? So the irreducible one, the response in the induced charge due to a change in the total potential. Well, these are these quantities that we saw before, reducible polarizability, irreducible one, a symmetric Coulomb kernel, and the Dyson equation that relates the uh, reducible to the irreducible polarizability. So that looks all, uh, well, it looks horrible, but th this is all sort of uh, clean, and, and, and we, can, uh, uh, we can cast our problem in quantities that, uh, that, we, that we can write down in formulas, but we don't know them, right? So how do we compute uh, P and how do we compute g chi? We don't know these quantities we can't get from our computations, unfortunately. So the only quantity that we can actually easily access in our, in our computations in Concham density functional theory is what is called the irreducible polarizability in the independent particle picture. 
And it's commonly labeled a uh, chi naught or um, a chi cone sham. And chi naught is, sorry, this is the change, the induced, the change in the induced charge density due to a change in the effective potential. So not in the total potential, not in the uh, external potential, but in the effective potential. And what's this effective potential? We've been seeing this Hamiltonian uh, uh, plotted a, a few times here, uh, where we had a, a, a kinetic energy and a local potential. Well, this local potential is often called the effective potential. And OK, well, that we can vary and look at what happens to the density. So this is a quantity that we can actually compute in our, uh, in our calculations, right? So an Adler, Adler and Weiser uh, derived expressions for this, uh, which are completely, uh, well, the only ingredients that go in are, are things that we, that we actually know from our computations. So if you look here, uh, don't, don't spend too much on, on, on trying to understand this equation per se, but just see that what it contains are Bloch functions, huh? So eigenfunctions, solutions of, of this Kohn-Sham equations that we calculate, and eigenenergies, so, so things that we calculate. Uh, here we see uh, th these are these occupational numbers of our, of our Bloch states. So we see here that only if one of those states is <coughs> occupied and the other one is unoccupied, uh, it actually contributes. Um, sums that we here see are over, over k and over um, sorry, over, over n and n prime, so over two band indices, where one is an occupied band and the other one an unoccupied band. So we have two sums over band indices, but not only over occupied states. So that is, that is one aspect of these computations that now comes along for the first time. In, in all the other uh, things that we have been looking at, it was always occupied states. Occupied states that give us the density, occupied states that, that uh, that participate in the Fock potential, but now we see we have a quantity that depends on unoccupied states as well. So our computations will become more uh, expensive, not only because we have here a double sum that we, and a sum over k, and we need to do this for uh, a number of points q and g and g prime and, 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 and frequencies omega, so it's already expensive in, in itself, and so this evaluating this scales as n to the power four with respect to system size. Um, but not only that, one of these indices runs over unoccupied states, which of which there are essentially uh, an infinite number. Uh, we'll obviously, we'll not be using an infinite number. But uh, yes, the computational effort will, uh, will grow. So uh, when we notice this, the, the irreducible polarizability in the independent particle picture, this chi not the other ones, the ones that we need to, uh, uh, the reducible and irreducible polarizability, uh, that we need to compute our uh, microscopic dielectric uh, function, uh, they are related, uh, they can be computed out of this, um, out of this irreducible polarizability in the independent particle picture. So the one that we compute from our cone sham functions. And that is written here. So those are Dyson-like equations again, um, where we have chi naught, where we can compute. We see our Coulomb kernel here. We see something that depends on the density functional. So this is Fxc. Fxc is the change in our exchange correlation uh, potential with respect to the density. So it's a quantity that we can actually compute. And are these relationships that hold. And these are the ones that we saw before that give us access to these dielectric functions that we're after. <coughs> so in the random phase approximation, and that's one thing that, uh, that, that we are going to use widely because it's, um, because it's computationally attractive. In the random phase approximation, we say that uh, the irreducible polarizability is simply equal to the irreducible polarizability in the independent particle picture, which essentially means that we set this fxc to zero. And that's the essence of the, of the, um, of the random phase approximation. So and that gives us this particular uh, uh, relationship between our dielectric function, our microscopic dielectric function, and this polarizability that we compute from our Consham system. <coughs> so we can go beyond, and that, that was mentioned on one of, one of the first slides, so we can go beyond the random phase approximation 
and include changes in the exchange correlation potential, so not set this thing to zero, and then we get, uh, get such an equation. And that is what we commonly call uh, local field effects in, in density functional theory. So, and this is local field effects in the random phase approximation. Right. So, as we saw before, um, in the long wavelength limit, so, uh, so, so now we try to connect to, to exp experiment, to experiment. Um, so in the long wavelength limit for Q goes to zero of the dielectrics matrix, uh, we, the dielectric matrix gives us access to, to optical properties in regimes that are, um, that are probed by, by optical measurements. And the microscopic dielectric tensor, epsilon infinity, for instance, uh, of omega is given by this particular relationship, right? And this quantity we now can, can calculate, for instance, in this random phase approximation. From, from our cone sham polarizability, we can uh, calculate this, this inverse dielectric <coughs> matrix in the random phase approximation, for instance, and uh, get access to, uh, to epsilon infinity. So we can do this at various levels of, of approximation. Like I mentioned before, we can stay within the independent particle picture. That is what we saw before. That was this, this, uh, this truly, uh, truly trivial relationship. Uh, but we can also include local field effects, as I mentioned before, in the random phase approximation or beyond uh, adding them, uh, adding changes in the DFT exchange correlation potential as well. So, these are tags that are related to this. So if you switch on L optics is true, you get this particular, uh, get this particular uh, quantity written out. If you want to go beyond, you can use algo is chi. That uses a lot of the machinery that, that will be used for, for GW as well. So it's, it's quite a bit more <coughs> expensive. And then you can get a, a better approximation or a more fancy approximation to your um, dielectric screening. Right. Okay. So how do we do this? Um, how do we do this in the code for uh, for uh, for L optics is true? Uh, for instance, well, here this is the thing that we we want to uh, evaluate. Um, so how do we get this? We compute the imaginary part of the of this of this tensor. Uh, directly from the from the cell periodic parts of the of the cone sham orbitals, and then uh, do a Kramer Kroner Kram, Kramer's chronic transformation to get at the, at the real part of this particular quantity. So the computational effort in this case lies in computing these functions. So these ones are are easy easily uh, are we can get at easily. Uh, those are our block states, but Actually, in this in this Q to go to zero, going to zero limit, we need uh, the the change in the in these orbitals um, at k. So uh, so we need them <coughs> at at a, at a very small vector, an infinitesimally small vector away from our Bloch factor. Um, so what we actually need to compute is the first order change in the cell period part of our of our Bloch functions. And that we do in, uh, in perturbation theory. So that is, that is written here. So, uh, so an orbital um, at a cell period, periodic part of a cone sham function, uh, sorry, of a Bloch function, um, slightly away from k, can be written in this way. So it's a Taylor expansion. So it's the function at k. Uh, and then this is the derivative of that function with respect to k times this small change, right? And from perturbation theory, uh, we know expressions for this. Uh, these are the changes of our Hamiltonian with respect to k, changes of our overlap matrix with respect to k, all kind of things that we can compute. Uh, and then this is a standard first order um, perturbation theoretical expression where we have uh, sums over occupied and unoccupied states. Um, well, we can cast it that way, at least, that one runs over occupied states and one runs over unoccupied states. And 
yes, all kinds of things that we can uh, evaluate, but again, the need to be here because this such an expansion in perturbation theory essentially runs over all states, all states of your Hamiltonian, of the unperturbed Hamiltonian. So for these kind of things, again, we have to include uh, many more states than we would need before for these ground state calculations. For ground state calculations, you're only interested in occupied states. Here we need to converge our result with respect to the number of unoccupied states that we, uh, that we include in this expansion, right, in this perturbative expression. So does it work? Yes, it does work. Um, so there's a paper describing the, the way uh, that we have implemented this, and there are some test cases where we, compl where we, uh, where we uh, compare to APW plus local orbitals. So this is the, the VIN2K code. Um, and uh, if you're interested, so there's examples where we, where we run exactly such a calculation in the hands-on section, and the quantities that, that you're after uh, well, I've, I've put in the strings that you can search for in the outcar file, and then there's a list of, of frequencies, and, uh, and you'll find the, the components of the dielectric tensor as a function of, of frequency um, directly after. And there's some little scripts that allow you to plot this quickly with, uh, with um, GNU plot. So, yes, well, this, I think this is only a repeat of what we already seen before, sorry. Yeah, so this is sort of a recap, right? <coughs> so the quantity that we are, that we use, the quantity th that we have access to, this irreducible polarizability in the independent particle <coughs> picture. Uh, and this is this Adler and Weiser expression that gives us access to this particular quantity. And that scales, uh, evaluating this scales as n to the power 4. So why is it n to the power 4? So for a large system, where we don't have k points, well, we can neglect k points here. We see that we have g and g prime, sum, sums over g and g prime. The number of plane waves uh, in our basis scales with system size, right? Then we have n and n prime, so the, the bands that scales with system size as well. So we have already four times system size, so this is n to the power four, right? So what? does this screening actually mean, right? So we have this in, in the RPA, so uh, and we saw these, these um, oh, it's unfortunate that I didn't put the, the Dyson equation there uh, cleanly, but what, we, what, ha what does this RPA give us actually? Uh, this random phase approximation that will, that will uh, pop up in GW and, and, and other uh, methods uh, later on. So in the random phase approximation, the dielectric screening is given by such an expansion. Uh, so our screened potential in the random phase approximation is given by, well, the, the Baer Coulomb, the Baer Coulomb interaction, and then uh, the el electronic environment. So the second term is the electronic environment that, uh, that reacts to the field generated by a particle. So we have a, n another particle that perturbs us as our, uh, as our particle travels to a system, through the system, it induces a change in the charge density, uh, and that uh, change in the charge density induces a change in the potential that works back on our particle. That's the second term. And then and, and you, can, uh, you can go on and on with this, because if we have an induced change in the potential, then, then there is another induced change in the density, and that will induce a change <coughs> in the potential. And that, so that is this whole chain of, of, uh, of terms that are written here, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, so electrons react to the induced change in the potential, and that will give an additional change in the charge density and a corresponding change in the Hartree potential, and so on, and so on. Uh, because this, these are all changes in the Hartree potential through this Coulomb coronal in the random phase approximation. And this, this can be written as a geometrical series, and so this whole collection of terms uh, up to, up to uh, infinitely long uh, terms you can write as a geometrical series given by the naked Coulomb interaction times the inverse of this. And this is exactly the inverse of this um, dielectric function. Uh, right, so in the random phase approximation, what do we actually compute? We compute a screened uh, a Coulomb interaction where all the all the 
all the um, physical processes involve, uh, involve the heart rate interaction, right? Involve changes in the heart rate potential. So that's the essence of the random phase approximation. Right. Um, yes, so you can uh, include that, yeah? uh, as we saw before, in using this algo is chi, you can <coughs> include um, all these, all these uh, processes <coughs> and this random phase approximation uh, in, into your computation of, of the dielectric properties, and you will get them um, in written into the R outcar file, right? So per default, uh, it's, it's all done at the level of RPA, um, but you can um, you can uh, include changes in the dense in the in the exchange correlation potential as well uh, here right <coughs> so um, yes so there's a few practical points and that will that will be of importance to computation of dielectric properties but it's also of importance to uh, well very much of importance for GW calculation where we'll use this uh, dielectric properties. I've been talking about the fact that we are going to be using these, these unoccupied states. Um, and the thing is that, that we, um, we use iterative matrix diagonalization to refine our states, right? We talked about this yesterday and I said, okay, this is very nice because we can get at, at the so many lowest states in our eigenvalue spectrum of, of our Hamiltonian matrix. And the thing is that these iterative techniques, um, they converge most rapidly for the deepest lying states. As you go up in, into the eigen, uh, eigenvalue spectrum, the states converge less and less rapidly. Um, so in, in for a ground state calculation, we look to the convergence of the occupied states, right? Because they give us the total energy and our convergence criterion only looks at total energy. It says, okay, if my total energy doesn't change by so and so much anymore, I say I'm converged, right? But now we, we will use uh, the virtual states, so the empty states in the spectrum as well, and they don't contribute to the total energy, so the quality of those states and whether or not they are converged doesn't express itself in the total energy. So you, couldn't, you can't simply do, a, do a, a calculation that includes simply more bands and then say, okay, now I'm converged because then the virtual states uh, are, well, less converged than the, than the occupied states. So the quality of your virtual states, of your unoccupied bands is not guaranteed. So we do a trick to, to get around this. We do a ground state calculation, a simple one, uh, where, we, where we simply uh, use the, the number of bands uh, that, that we would use for any normal ground state calculation and then to obtain virtual orbitals of su sufficient quality, we do one exact diagonalization of the Hamiltonian. So that's the thing that I said yesterday. Well, that, that is the thing that we want to avoid because um, hey, why would I do an exact diagonalization and compute 50,000 uh, 50, <coughs> eigenstates of my Hamiltonian when I'm only interested in four? Well, here we'll do one step of this yeah, on top of such a ground state calculation. So Essentially, our occupied states have converged. Our Hamiltonian is correct in that sense. And then we build up this Hamiltonian. So we restart the calculation, read in those wave functions, build up the Hamiltonian that is defined by the occupied states, diagonalize it one time, uh, and then we have all unoccupied states correct as well. So the quality of those states will be as good as uh, the ones uh, that we have optimized for the op occupied part of the spectrum. So that's an additional step um, that, that you would need to do to get, to get uh, high quality virtual orbitals. Yeah. Yeah. Is that not incredibly costly? Because say you only want 10%. If you do an iterative scheme but you have a criteria, even the empty state yes. for the convergence. Yes. That is, that is something that, uh, that, that we will have to uh, implement very soon would be a better way to do it. Um, but at the moment, that's not present yet. So one can obviously say, uh, I don't look at the, at the um, so you wouldn't have to look per se at the total energy to judge whether you're converged. You can look at the eigenenergies of, 
of any number of states and as they uh, stop changing uh, or, or are converged with, with a certain degree, you could say, okay, I'm, I'm done. Uh, that would allow you to keep using these iterative matrix diagonalization techniques. Yes, that's definitely true and we should change this, but at the moment that's not possible yet. It's quite unfortunate. So we are forced to do this, uh, to do this uh, three uh, steps. And, and you're right, this is a very costly step for large systems. It's even so, and that is why we'll definitely, uh, we'll definitely change it uh, 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 pretty soon. Um, it's even so that this step becomes the most costly step even for, for some GW calculations. So doing the actual GW afterwards is not as costly as doing this, uh, this exact diagonalization, um, which is unfortunate. On the other hand, and that is why, why, we, why, we still, uh, why we'll still use this in the future as well, that all the, all the convergence criteria that we use, and, and we'll show this later on, so there's, um, especially for, for uh, total energies in the random phase approximation, we do a trick to, um, to extrapolate the result to an infinite basis set size, and for that you would need all states of, of your system. Um, so this, this will be a, a valuable thing even in the future, but for, for very large systems and for GW, this is something that, uh, that might kill you uh, at the moment. That is true. So these are the typical steps that you would do. Uh, and uh, well, in this case, it's only a calculation of the dielectric properties uh, per se. So the three steps is a ground set calculation, <coughs> then this exact diagonalization step where you, uh, where you ask for, uh, ask for a, a larger number of empty states. Uh, those are so it's done. The matrix is is diagonalized exactly, and then uh, a bunch of those empty states are kept and written out to your wave car file. And afterwards, you uh, can restart again from that file uh, using either of these methods to uh, to compute um, dielectric properties. So, yeah, yes. So, I, I can I can repeat the question. So so how do we so how do we uh, diagonalize this this matrix exactly? Um, so that that is essentially simply calling a scale layback routine. So the matrix is set up and then scale layback is called to uh, to to diagonalize it. So. Um, yeah, so it is distributed, and how, how large are these, are these matrices? Uh, so in many cases, they're of the size of 50,000 times 50,000 entries. Yes, so I, I recently did a calculation on, um, on a cell uh, with 256, uh, so a GW calculation on a cell with 256 silicon atoms, um, and there it was something like 47,000 bands. So the whole spectrum. Depends, it's really, yeah, it's quite sizable, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So it, it would pay off uh, to, uh, to be able to skip this step. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So is there a rule of thumb how much lo uh, larger thin bands should be set? Um, well, that is, that is the thing. So, so uh, is there a rule of thumb? Yes, there are many rules of thumb. So I. I uh, but I mean, so for silicon, and that is the well, this is our favorite test system. Let's say everything always works for silicon uh, because it has been tested <laughs> with silicon. Um, I I would use something like 64 uh, states per silicon atom, right? So which means that in that particular calculation that I did with 256 um, silicon atoms, I kept 16,000 bands. For a large cell, it's, it can be quite sizable. I think it depends on how accurate you want your results to be. Um, you could get away probably with 32 bands per, per, per atom as well. Go to another system. I don't know. I don't want to venture. I don't want to 
to tell you, yes, always use 64 bands per atom, right? So I, I simply don't know. And it's one of the things why, it, why, I mean, you can get around this step by simply using all bands. And the number of bands you get is then simply defined by your cutoff, and then your results, again, are going to converge with your energy cutoff. Uh, because the size of this matrix is directly defined by your basis set cutoff. Uh, because it's the size of the FFT grid, um, and that is defined by your cutoff. And so in this way, um, you, you get around, uh, around this uncertainty, uncertainty by simply using all bands. And then there's clever algorithms by which we can extrapolate to infinite basis set size. Because we know how it should, uh, how it should converge with respect to, uh, as your cutoff is high enough, we know the convergence behavior with respect to the cutoff, and then we uh, do an extrapolation. But that can only work if you use all bands uh, that, that are, <coughs> if you use all states of your Hamiltonian. Yeah, so it, it does pay off to, to still do that, actually, especially for, for GW and ACFDT calculations, as we'll see later on. Um, yes, so here come these GW potentials that maybe people have, um, have already seen, uh, because I and already mentioned this yesterday, that we now uh, depend on, uh, uh, we, we need a certain amount of, of virtual states as well. Uh, so we need potentials that are, uh, that are sufficiently accurate that they describe the scattering properties up to, uh, up to higher uh, in, in, the, in the energy spectrum. So and if you look at the conventional uh, silicon PAW uh, potential, you see that up to two to three Rydbergs, uh, the, the match between the dotted lines and, uh, and, the, and the drawn lines is still quite good. So the pseudo atom and the all electron atom have the, essentially the same scattering properties, but higher up in the spectrum you start to see deviations. So this potential will not yield very high quality virtual states uh, because they depend on scattering properties higher up in the spectrum. Uh, and these GW potentials have been constructed to match the scattering properties up to much higher energies. And that is the, 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 essen the, the essential uh, step, which, which is why we, we, um, why we advise to use these potentials if you go to any of these methods that include sums over virtual states. Yeah. They're good for ground state calculations as well, right? I mean, so it doesn't spoil the, the it doesn't spoil the the properties for ground state calculations. So um, yes, so let's turn to static dielectric response. Uh, so uh, in the static dielectric response, there's a few things that we that we calculate. <coughs> so that the program can calculate for you the ion clamped static macroscopic dielectric tensor. So this is this epsilon infini infinity at uh, omega is zero at zero frequency. Uh, the Born effective charge tensors that I that I spoke about. So those are the, the amount of charge that moves with your uh, atom. So so the change in the polarization of your system when you move an atom. Um, electronic contributions to uh, piezoelectric tensors. Uh, given here, and we can calculate them either using density functional perturbation theory, using L epsilon is true, or from the self-consistent response of the orbitals to finite electric fields, and that is uh, using this algorithm. Um, so there's examples in the hands-on session uh, that, that deal with these uh, aspects. Right, so, for, uh, so using density functional perturbation theory, so essentially, uh, the, the, the thing that we have to compute um, here is again the derivative of this um, of, of our of the cell periodic part of our Bloch functions with respect to the Bloch wave vector. Um, in case of density functional perturbation <coughs> theory, we don't use a sum over empty states to do this. So it's not this this first order um, um, perturbation theory where we have a sum over uh, over uh, uh, sorry, over empty states, but we, uh, we solve a, a linear Sternheimer equation uh, that looks like this. 
Uh, so, th this, so this, the number of states for which we have to do this, is of the order of the uh, occupied states, right? So that, that is nice. That's a nice thing uh, from density functional perturbation theory. Um, so actually, so that, that we solve for this particular quantity. And uh, uh, this particular quantity actually is, uh, is, uh, is needed to express our perturbation. So we solve. Uh, our perturbation is a, it's a, it's a, a bit of a strange thing in these in this, uh, elect static electric fields. Uh, so this is a, um, a static electric field uh, at, at Q is 0. So that means it's a constant uh, field, right, over our material. And that poses a problem for, uh, for the kind of methods that we use, because a constant electric field is a, well, that is a, a constantly dropping potential over a system with periodic boundary conditions. So it's not, it's not a perturbation that we can express under periodic boundary conditions. Right? This, this potential that we add, we cannot cast in periodic boundary conditions. But there's a way to include it, and that is by computing this quantity from perturbation theory. And then essentially, we use this quantity, uh, and we see it here, right, in a second perturbative expression. And this quantity, so the change in our, in our functions <coughs> with, with respect to k, represents our perturbation. So I, I, I won't show you here why that is actually true. But it's possible to cast this, this non-periodic perturbation into a form that is, that is again, cell-periodic. And that is done by this first, uh, by this first um, Sternheimer equation gives us this, gives us actually a representation of our electric field, of our perturbation. And then we solve a second, uh, a second um, Sternheimer equation um, to get at the response uh, in our orbitals uh, due to this uh, due to this perturbation, and this can include uh, all kinds of local field effects. So, which means that we can include the response this in our self-consistent Hamiltonian due to uh, this perturbation, right? So, which is commonly called these local field effects, and they may be included at the RPA level again, or um, or beyond this, including changes in the DFT exchange correlation potential in our Hamiltonian. But once we know the response uh, in our orbitals due to uh, our perturbation, we can uh, quite easily calculate, well, microscopic dielectric matrix given by this, uh, where this sum now uh, runs over virtual, uh, over occupied states only. So there's no sum over unoccupied states anymore. And uh, we can compute a host of other quantities from this, like Born effective charges and, and these uh, piezoelectric tensors, by simply uh, looking at changes in the Hellman Feynman forces as we change our orbitals with respect to, this, to, the, to their response to the perturbation. And we do this in finite differences. Uh, so we add, a, we add a bit of this, of this uh, response to our current wave functions and look at the change in our forces or in our stresses, and that gives us um, <coughs> that gives us then uh, so the change in the Hellman Feynman force with respect to the field is uh, the Born effective charge, which is equivalent to the change in the polarization of our system with respect to ad atomic displacement. Same thing here: the change in the in the um, in the stress tensor with respect to um, to our electric field gives us the electronic contribution to the piezoelectric tensors. Wait, yeah, and the chain, yeah. Could you just explain the notation epsilon infinity at omega equals zero? Um, what does the infinity part refer to if it's static and omega is zero? Is it just because it's the electronic part that it's the Yes, okay. yes. But so I and Clamp. Okay, but it, it's yes. not uh, so the, the I, so, so supposedly too fast for the ions to, to, uh, to react to. Okay, but it's not the actual omega equals infinity. No, epsilon. no, 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 no. Okay. So at omega equals so zero, zero. Yes. The yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Actually, the infinity is really horrible. That this that it's common notation, yeah. but it really puts you on the on the wrong foot. Okay. I because I it's the frequency is zero for the electrons, but it's like infinite frequency for the ions, right? Okay. I mean, they have no time to react, so it's 
stupid, yeah. <coughs> okay, the output um, of all these calculations, well, this is, this is more relevant for, for uh, when we turn, in, uh, turn to the hands-on section. This gives you uh, somewhere where to find all, these, uh, all this information in the output. Um, yes, then there's a bunch of examples. Well, let's not go through that because we're approaching lun lunch time. Um, let's quickly go through this um, through this response to uh, to finite electric fields. Um, <coughs> so there's another way to compute these quantities. Eh? So the, the first we saw was density functional perturbation theory, but there's also a way to include the effects of a finite electric field, eh? even though we said okay. Uh, this field is it's the potential uh, that, that corresponds to this finite electric field is not something that we can uh, represent under periodic boundary conditions. There is a way uh, to actually uh, include the effects for, I for insulating systems. <coughs> and that, uh, that is based on this what is called the modern theory of polarization. Well, it's always very bad to call anything modern because it is modern at some point and this is already uh, some years old, so <laughs> yeah, right. So in in in, in one hundred years, it's definitely not <laughs> going to be modern anymore. But it's still called this. Um, so and that says we we can change. So th th that's one of the things that that is maybe a bit counterintuitive. Uh, the fact that we can compute the polarization under periodic boundary conditions is not a trivial statement in itself. Um, and that is uh, maybe I can can sketch again on this nice wall. Um, and that is, under periodic boundary conditions, we have the following problem. So let's say if I have a, if I have a dipole in a system, it's, it's easy to, to compute the, uh, the polarization because of this. It's no, there's no essential problem. But if I, if I, now, uh, so if I now put repeated um, uh, dipoles, which we have under periodic boundary conditions, it becomes a non-trivial thing to compute this because I can choose my cell to be this, right? And then integrate over the charge, it will give me one answer. But I can also choose, and that's completely equivalent, I can choose my cell to be this. And this will be a completely different dipole, right? So under periodic boundary conditions, for the longest time people said there's no way to define the polarization of a truly periodic system. And then came, along came the modern theory of polarization and said, well, this is possible, actually. And there's a bunch of equations that, uh, that one can evaluate, and they will give us this pol macroscopic polarization of a periodic system. Um, so I've, I've just sketched uh, the route to, uh, to this result here, uh, because in Bloch functions, it's always very uh, difficult to do this. But we can go to a, to a Vanier function uh, description, so localized uh, charges. And for localized charges, uh, so localized <laughs> functions, it is uh, easy to define uh, a dipole moment in, in a system. Uh, and then you, can, then you go through a whole bunch of mathematical manipulations and end up with an equation that tells you that your macroscopic polarization depends on, and that, that is what we saw before, right? I already mentioned it. <coughs> the derivative of the, the cell periodic part of our Bloch functions with respect to the Bloch wave vector. Eh? We determined this before uh, from, from these density functional perturbation equations to include uh, electric fields. And here we see as this essential quantity popping up as well. OK. Uh, for the interest of time, we'll, we'll simply believe this. And, uh, and we say, OK, we have a, a way to compute the polarization of our system. And this opens now a route to include uh, the effects of a, of a finite electric field as well. Because we'll simply add a term. So this is our, our, our normal ground state uh, DFT energy, right, with wave functions. And now we'll add a term, which is essentially the in product between the finite electric field that we're considering and the macroscopic polarization of our system. So this is a, gives us a new total energy that includes the effect of a finite electric field 
uh, on our system. So an additional term in our total energy uh, that depends on this expression that we saw before that comes out of the modern theory of polarization, an additional term in our total energy will add a, a corresponding term to the Hamiltonian, uh, and that is, well, th this one. Uh, so the, the difference, the variation of our polarization with respect to an orbital is added to our Hamiltonian. And then we simply do a, a self-consistent calculation for this particular Hamiltonian and minimize this total energy. So there are some considerations. You cannot make this field um, uh, too big uh, because at some point you will, you will start to close your gap. Uh, so that is, that is sketched on this slide and that is argued in, in this particular paper if you're interested in this. Uh, so there's, there's a criterion implemented how strong you can make your field um, before, you, uh, before you close your gap. You, you must have a gap, so the system must be insulating, but then you can, uh, th then you can uh, optimize your wave functions with respect to this particular energy functional and use these, uh, use these solutions to compute the quantities that we have seen before, right? Because we can, um, we can compute the change in the polarization now uh, uh, with respect to an, a finite electric field. And we saw that this change in the polarization with respect to the field <coughs> gives us uh, our static macroscopic dielectric matrix. And the Born effective charges associated with this, we can again, like before, compute from, uh, we apply an electric field, we have a slight change in the wave functions, and through this, a change in the Hellman Feynman forces, uh, and the change in these forces with respect to the field give us the Born effective charges. So, the essential the quantities that we get from density functional perturbation theory can get from a response to, uh, to these finite fields as well. And of course, all local field effects are included in a very natural manner uh, because we, we do a self-consistent calculation. You apply a field and then you do a self-consistent calculation. So all variations, all changes in potentials due to the field are naturally included in this. Um, right, due, through the self-consistency. Um, so that's very nice and we can do this for any Hamiltonian. So density functional perturbation theory you can do for density functionals but not for uh, hybrid functionals, but this works for hybrid functionals as well. Okay, so there's some numbers here that we that we gotten with this, and um, yeah, so I, I think we'll skip this. These are essentially only details on, on these particular uh, terms. You can look at them at, at your leisure, but but I think you this, this uh, I've already sketched the um, um, the general, uh, the general idea of it. Uh, I think we'll we'll stop here. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Um, we have a couple of questions online. Do you want to do them before lunch or after? Um, I, I would like to. If there are questions here, then I, I would do the the. the yeah, so uh, one is relating uh, to GW. Can GW potentials be used for the usual calculations instead of having two sets of? Yes. 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 Uh, another is, what about the equivalent, uh, uh, more, more recent, what about the equivalent response to magnetic fields? Can VASP predict um, structural and electronic response in magnetic fields as well? No. No, it can, it can do, uh, so it can do uh, NMR. So yep. that, that is what you can do. So you can compute, uh, you can compute, but you can't compute structural responses to, to magnetic fields. Um, and we have one more question actually relating to this morning's session came up. Yeah. Um, from your experience, what's the biggest system that you've been able to do using HSE in terms of you know, you know, size of system? Yeah, so the, the biggest system that, that I have been able to do is not very big because we are poor Austrians and we don't have computers. <laughs> but no, I know people that do, uh, that do HSE calculations on systems with thousands of atoms. Completely beyond anything that I have experience with. I don't know how painful it is and how big the machine has to be, but I think, I, what is, 
you would have maybe an idea of what, what a common size at NERSC is for, for. Do you have some feeling? Yeah. yeah. I know I, I got, I got uh, some, some benchmarks from a, from a guy on, and he was using a Cray machine and he could go up to thousands of cores so he had access to a fair amount of cores and I think he did systems of some thousands of atoms or a thousand of atoms, things like this. So it is possible, it's surely painful. I'm absolutely sure it, is, it hurts <laughs> to do it. Yeah. Yes? Um. But sometimes you want to compute like dielectric properties of systems where you know it's a semiconductor, but GGA gives it it's either a metal or a very, very small band gap, which yep. will totally throw off the calculus. Thing. Yes. What's your suggestion for those sorts of, do we add a plus U and do GGA plus U or what? what I, I would probably, the first thing I would do is a scissor operator. Okay, so I try and find a place in the metallic bands to cut it and then... Uh, so if it's, if it's a metal? Uh, sorry, either, I thought either, that if, you, if your band really gap is too small. Okay, so, okay, let, let, let's take the band gap really too small. If you did the scissor, is there a procedure in VASP where I can just give it um, like a scissor? Okay. So. Yes. So, but for a metallic system, I don't know how you would scissor. <laughs> okay. But then I would probably go for a hybrid functional. Yes. So like a fully hybrid dielectric? Yes. Although, although, and that is something that will come up, uh, although that then you're already, so if DFT gives you such a bad answer for the, for the ground state, then I would try with a hybrid functional. Uh, but that's something that, that I'll discuss tomorrow. What, what, I mean, there's, there's, this, there's a compensation, uh, there's a compensation of errors uh, involved in using the random phase approximation and DFT. So you do get really good screening properties if you use the random phase approximation in connection with DFT orbitals and eigenenergies. So if you go beyond uh, DFT, then the random phase approximation will start to show up as, as, a, as a, 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 well, its limits will start to show up more <coughs> clearly. Uh, the same thing if you go beyond the random phase approximation. Um, so no. Uh, yes, it was like I said before. So if you if you use anything but DFT with the random phase approximation, you do not got, uh, get as good screening properties. So especially for GW, if you then there there's some aspects of this. I will I will I will discuss them uh, tomorrow. And could uh, you quickly sketch out the procedure where if you had a small band gap and you wanted to just open it up to the experimental value, what's the procedure for doing that and feeding that into BAS for the dielectric calculation? Um, you mean in terms of of a uh, of, uh, of a of a um, sorry in terms of a scissor operator? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Let's say I, I will have to look it up, but okay. it, but it's I mean it's a scissor operator is is super easy, right? You don't do anything to your orbitals; you just shift your unoccupied uh, eigen energies with respect to the to the occupied ones. But how do I tell the dielectric constant to use those those orbitals? How do you call it? Yeah. How do I call it in bass but Okay, so, so I have a GGA stat calculation. Gives me a gap of 0.1, right? And now I want to run a dielectric, but I want to run it with a that gap of 0.5 or something. Right, right, right. Uh, so yeah, so how do you apply the, the scissor operator? Yeah. I, I will have to look, look it up. I, I mean, it's, in one, it's used in one of the examples, okay. uh, but I will have to make sure that it, that it will work in the way that, that, you, uh, that you need. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and it's something, I mean, it, it, it is so simple that if, if there's something still missing there, we can easily, quickly fix this. Okay. Yeah. Yes. To make it work in a, in a manner that is convenient to you. Yeah. Um, do yeah. these calculations work for isolated molecules if you're detecting like the dielectric functions? <coughs> so would you get the dielectric properties of isolated molecules? Um, I don't see a reason why why not. Okay. I, I don't know how good DFT or, or these methods would or the random phase approximation would be for isolated molecules, though. Or so so I have no experience doing this for for isolated molecules. But there's n there's no essential uh, there's nothing in any approximation that would would invalidate the procedure for isolated molecules. Okay. Right. Yeah. So if you wanted to see what the reflectivity of the gas would be, maybe you could. Well, you could put in 
bunches of molecules probably in a cell and and I, I, I guess it should work. I, I've, I've never tried, so it's an interesting, interesting question. But I don't see that there's there's not a from from the algorithm algorithmic point of view, there's nothing that speaks against it. Okay. I, would, would you have to have all those molecules? In, like, would you have to have each molecule in a different cell, or maybe? Yeah. I. I I, I, without a lawyer, I won't answer this question. <laughs> no, I don't know. Sorry. 